security prison on Alcatraz Island. They were Frank Morris, Alan West, and the two brothers, Clarence and John Anglin. The inmates were career criminals who knew each other from previous incarcerations. Their planning began months beforehand when they were put in adjacent cells. Over six months, they built an inflatable raft, paddles, and life vests out of velvet raincoats. To seal the seams, they pressed the raincoats against the hot steam pipes. During the daily hour, when inmates were allowed to play instruments and sing, the men each chipped away at a vent that was found beneath the sinks until it was wide enough for them to fit through. Once on the other side, they had access to an unguarded utility corridor. Then they could climb to the roof and go outside. In order to hide their progress, they made a cardboard cutout and painted over it. They used contact cement to stick the cardboard to the wall. On the night of June 11th, the men placed paper mache heads into their beds. They followed the plan, and at about 10 p.m., it is believed they disembarked from Alcatraz's northeast shore. Together, they paddled out into the dark, cold night on their raft. Their fate remains uncertain. From the island to the mainland is around two miles long. Later that year, another inmate, John Scott, successfully swam to shore. He was naked and without a raft in much colder temperatures. He was found on the beach in San Francisco and taken back to the prison. One of the four, Alan West, failed in his escape attempt. The cement Alan had used hardened, causing his vent cover to be difficult to remove. When he finally removed the vent cover, the other three men were already gone. He returned to his cell and slept. The next day, June 12, a raft was discovered on Angel Island, and footprints were leading away from the raft. The same day, in 1955, Blue Chapelet had been reported stolen in Marin County. It was also reported at 11.30 a.m. a motorist in Stockton, California had been forced off the road by three men in a blue Chevrolet. Here is a picture posted by the History Channel who they believe to be the Anglin brothers sometime after their escape. but this has not been confirmed. The FBI concluded the men were lost at sea and handed the case to the U.S. Marshal Service. The case remains open and the three men are on their wanted list. Next is the Alvin Sea Serpent. Sightings 
activated 
shipwreck. 
historians suggest that if they reached the Spanish Caribbean, he might have been killed by Spaniards. One man named Lancelot Virgil was listed as a crew member and was alive and in England three years after the expedition. He could have been from the ship that turned back, but it's not clear. Hardly any documentation exists, which is unusual if there were survivors. Some believe the crew did return. This seems plausible, because of all the Atlantic explorations in that century, there was no instance of a multi-ship expedition having been completely wiped out by an unknown disaster. Alwyn Ruddock was a London University professor who spent her life researching Cabot. She claimed to have discovered a great deal of information about Cabot's life and death. According to her, Cabot did not die on his final voyage, but some time after. Ruddock believed the final expedition lasted two years, and they travelled down the east coast of North America, possibly as far as the Spanish Caribbean. After leaving several crew members behind, the ships returned to England, where Cabot died several months later. The theory seems to explain the voyage well. However, in 2005, when she died at 89, she ordered the executor of her will to destroy all her research, which was 78 bags of paper with thousands of notes, letters, and documents. One historian described himself as shocked and sickened at this. At the time of her death, she claimed to be working on several books documenting her findings, but no manuscript was ever found. In 1992, a colleague had written to her, saying, it is rather difficult for anyone else in this field to make progress until you have produced your documents. I turned up recently a letter of yours from 1965 in which you said confidently that the documents and their context were almost complete and you expected to produce them very soon. That was 27 years ago. In her will, she wrote, I much dislike posthumous publications and do not wish anyone to try to finish work left unfinished by me at the time of my death. So it's not clear how much of her theory had real evidence to back it up. Next is the flashing light. De Lapa is a Polynesian term meaning flashing light. It is an unexplained and scientifically unproven light phenomenon underneath or on the surface of the ocean. It was used by historic and modern Polynesians as a navigation aid to find islands in the Pacific Ocean. A New Zealand doctor, David Lewis, witnessed it on his Pacific voyages with traditional navigators who have long used the Lapa as a navigation aid although no one can explain its source. In his book, 
not know any of the other 22 passengers or crew. There was no head count on the boat when the passengers disembarked. Some personal belongings, including his car keys, passport and wallet, were found on the boat, and his car was found parked near the marina where he had left it. His absence was not noticed until July 6, a week later, when he failed to attend a family event. He was reported missing on July 11. The U.S. Coast Guard investigation concluded he was likely lost at sea. They did not find any evidence of criminal action, suicide, accident, or hoax. His body was never recovered. It was later revealed Patrick owed multiple people a lot of money, including Olivia Newton-John. Soon, people began to speculate he purposely faked his death avoid paying them back. However, there was no evidence for this theory. The case was featured on America's Most Wanted. In 2009, on Dateline NBC, investigators went undercover to look for Patrick in Mexico, where they believed he might be hiding. Those same investigators created a website, findpatrickmcdermott.com, for the sole purpose of trapping Patrick. As the episode aired, all visitors' web addresses were logged and mapped. The investigators believed that Patrick was living in a boat off the west coast of Mexico. They continued to track hits to their website and claimed there were over 20 sightings of Patrick in Mexico and Central America. A private detective claimed to have found him living under his birth name, Patrick Kim, in a small fishing village, Sayurita, Mexico with a new girlfriend. In 2017, a different detective claimed to have photographic evidence showing someone who matched Patrick's description alongside a woman on a beach. However, a man from Canada later came forward identifying himself and his wife as the subject of the photo. Next is the adult facet detector. Facet detector are tiny ocean creatures whose larvae have been found worldwide since their discovery in 1887. However, their adult form is unknown. The creature is only known from its larvae, having two types, the Y. nobleus and Y. cyprid larvae. In 2008, a juvenile form was artificially produced by treating larvae with a hormone, which stimulated the transition to a new life phase. The resulting animal, named the Ypsigon, was slug-like and limbless. The larvae have been found around the world, from the Arctic to the tropical waters of all oceans. The adult organism has never been identified, and the first detector is the only crustacean with a formal classification based 
solely on the larval stages. It is not the adult facetic actor or endoparasitic, meaning a parasite that lives in the internal organs or tissues of its host. The juvenile stage represents similarities to those seen in parasitic barnacles. The abundance of Pasitodacta larvae in the oceans suggest that these parasites are widespread and could play an important role in the marine environment. Next is Tammy Grogan. In 2006, 35 year old single mother Tammy Grogan was on board a carnival cruise line ship when she vanished somewhere between Mexico and Miami. Traveling with her was her mother Bonnie, her 14 year old son. Jimmy and her aunt Deb. The trip's final stop before heading home was in Mexico. Her family reported seeing Tammy on the ship after that time around 1.30 a.m. on Sunday, September 10th. She did not return to the cabin and was not reported missing until the next day when the ship reached its final destination, Miami. Her family said they believed she was simply off enjoying herself. They didn't become worried until she missed a planned meeting on Monday. Ships in the Gulf were notified but a full-scale search was not launched. She has never been found and is presumed to be dead at sea. Reports in the days after her disappearance stated that foul play was not suspected. However, there is more to her story which suggests otherwise. About 18 months later, Tammy's mother, Bonnie, gave an interview to local news, claiming the trip had been an elaborate scheme to get rid of Tammy. Bonnie accused Craig Morgan, the man who had purchased the cruise tickets for the family, of planning her death so that he would have unrestricted access to Jimmy, her 14-year-old son. 25-year-old Greg had reportedly been spending a lot of time with the boy, taking him on limo rides and buying gifts. Tammy's father, Bob, grew frustrated with the friendship particularly when he walked in at one point and saw Jimmy and Craig in an affectionate hug. Tammy finally told Craig the family was uncomfortable with the touchy-feely friendship that he and Jimmy had and that he was no longer welcome around them. Tammy also told Jimmy he could no longer see Craig anymore. Shortly after, 
Jimmy was listed as living 